This is Michael Dawes, Director of Public Relations at Barton Community College, and you're tuned in to Cougar Paws on KVGB 1590 AM. Today we're talking with Linda McCaffrey. She's History Instructor at the college. Uh, good morning to you, Linda. And uh, Linda spent years conducting oral histories with World War II veterans, uh, and from that labor of love has come a book that she has recently published titled, I'm Praying Hard for You, Love Letters to a Death Camp, The World War II Ordeal of Bill and Joe Brenner. Uh, we're going to talk about that book today because uh, Linda just recently got that published. So um, Linda, I know that was uh, a, a three-year labor for you to do, what was that process like to, to actually start a book and, and to get it through completion? Well, we began uh, really in 1991 when I did an oral history with Bill Brenner. And Dr. Brenner was a flight surgeon in the 21st Pursuit in the Philippines and was trapped on the Bataan Peninsula with 106,000 people with very, very little food. Uh, was in the Bataan Death March and then the two horrible camps, Camp O'Donnell and Camp Gabonatuan, before he was sent to prison camp in Japan. When he returned, he did not talk about this. And he said some men coped with their ordeal by drinking, he coped with it by working. Uh, in 1991, he finally agreed to do an interview. And his wife uh, sat and listened to the interview, was very touched by it because she didn't know the whole story. Uh, a few years later, they mentioned that they had a series of letters uh, in a shoebox. Well, I asked about the letters and, and they said, well, they've actually never been opened. And what Joe did, she was a young woman all by herself outside of San Francisco. And when Bill left in November of 1941, they knew they would be separated by two years. Uh, and she promised she would write to him twice a week, which she continued to do as the war began. The Army, of course, could not deliver those letters and the Army sent them back, and she kept writing more letters, and the Army sent those letters back, and she really pours her heart out in, in the letters. And they, they allowed me to open the letters and copy them, and for the first time, they were read, because Bill had no desire to read those. In fact, he had no desire to even think about the war and what had happened. Um, one letter that was in the box was the letter he wrote three days before they surrendered, where he basically tells her to go on with her life if he doesn't make it. I copied the letters, and then we started talking about writing a book. And the reason that Bill wanted the book written was so people would know that not only he suffered, but his wife also suffered those, those three and a half years that he was gone. Uh, we started working on it. Uh, I was encouraged by a friend from Wichita State named Judy Johnson. She was head of the history department there. She read the brief manuscript and said, I think this needs to be a book. And from there, expanded research. Uh, every page, every word, though, was approved by Bill Brenner because ultimately it is Bill and Joe's story. Joe passed away several years ago, uh, but we kept working and, and revising. And, and of course, there were, there were things that Bill wanted changed that were uh, maybe not in the right sequence. There were a couple things that really were too personal that we removed from the book. And after three years, Bill went through the final draft I had my friend Gary Kenyon go through the final draft for historical uh, reference to make sure there were no errors. And then uh, it, it was finished, of course, and, and a big part of it was uh, Dana Allison did a lot of the graphic work on it and also the reformatting to bring it down to a, a smaller format, six by nine. So that was the process. And now that I think back, it sounds kind of easy, but it sure took a lot of time. <laughs> And uh, obviously it took a lot of time for you. I'm sure when you interview, as you've done quite frequently with uh, many of these World War II veterans, uh, they're not real eager to come out and come forward with their stories. So to actually get to that point with Dr. Brenner uh, took a lot of years and a lot of trust that uh, went back and forth between both of you. Well, that's absolutely true. Uh, because what I've been asking him to relive is very, very painful. And there were sections that I would finish, and then he would keep them several days, uh, add, subtract. And, and it has to be very, very difficult to keep this buried, such a horrific uh, experience. You know, the Bataan Death March is probably one of the worst atrocities of World War II, and also the prison camps where he saw many, many men die. Uh, there were times myself that I had to put it away just not work on it for a little bit because it does get to you. 
uh, the, the horrific things that did happen. And then I'm asking him, uh, I, I, I experienced those in, in really the, the abstract, he experienced those in reality. Uh, oftentimes he would talk about the smells, and of course you can't get that from the printed word. Uh, but it was very difficult, and over time he um, added uh, things that would, had come back that he had buried so deep. But I think it was, it was an emotional uh, ride also for him, so, uh, and also myself. And, you know, obviously uh, many of our listeners are familiar with the Bataan uh, Death March, but can you provide to some of those listeners who aren't so familiar with it the, uh, the overview of what the Bataan Death March was? Sure. Um, the idea, of course, the United States had controlled the Philippines since the Spanish-American War, and they were slated for independence in 1945. And General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, was, was hired to put together an army for their self-defense. There had been a plan for a long time, and it was called uh, War Plan Orange, and that was if the Philippines had to be defended, that the army would pull back on the Bataan Peninsula in the Manila Harbor, right across from Manila, and hold out as long as they could, waiting for reinforcements. The plan had been to move enough supplies for 31,000 men to uh, survive as long as they could on, on the peninsula. Well, the plan was changed mostly by uh, General MacArthur. The uh, food was not, was not there, and so it turned into a terrible, terrible tragedy. Okay. You think about it, your book takes a different turn, though. I mean, it, it talks about these things, but then you also bring in these, love, or these letters and this love and this bond, and it brings that you know, it wasn't only those servicemen that were, even though they were in excruciating circumstances, um, you know, people were suffering back home who were longing for them to return. Well, and that, the reason, of course, we, Bill wanted the book written is he wanted people to know that he suffered, but Joe also suffered. And of course, she was a young woman with a baby. Their little boy was five months old when he left. Uh, and she was on an allotment, which means she did not get all of his salary, so money was very tight. She had to finally find a boarder, who she called her roomer, who also became a good friend in these lonely, lonely days, uh, so that she could make ends meet. She uh, sat at her, at her table, and the letters are, are very touching. She would get blue and, and, and write about uh, you know, how lonely she was and, and the anxiety and the money, and then she would buoy herself up and, and, and come back to something happy to talk about. She. Uh, she suffered from tremendous anxiety when uh, the Bataan Peninsula fell, and of course she knew that. She did not know where Bill was at. And then even worse, when Corregidor, which was the last American holdout uh, on the Luzon Island, uh, she receives a letter from Bill that he wrote before they surrendered just three days, and then she has no idea if he's dead or alive for 18 months. Uh, after 18 months, uh, Bill's commanding officer contacted him, her, of course, and he had uh, escaped to tell her the last time he had seen Bill, he was alive, and then right after that came a Red Cross postcard. In that postcard, she would receive four of those. There was uh, a line where they could write uh, 21 words and then check three boxes, my health is, but at least she knew he was alive. That 18 months was horrible. Uh, his family, uh, and they lived between McCracken and Bazine, uh, his younger brother said that uh, their mother was strong, it's in God's hands, but she had a little room off the kitchen and when she went in there to cry, they all knew to leave her alone. And of course their family faced double anxiety. Bill was a prisoner in the Philippines and then Japan, but uh, another boy, uh, Leo Brenner, was a prisoner in Germany and had been on a, a, a B-24 and had been shot down. So not knowing, having two sons that were prisoners of war and then one son who was uh, a pilot in the Pacific. And, and of course three sons and two prisoners and not knowing what must have been horrific for the families. I guess I want to stress here, obviously if you have somebody's World War II uh, vet or what have you, these, these histories are highly important to bring back and, and leave a legacy for. Uh, how do you approach that, Linda, when, when dealing with the fact that we are losing this uh, living history on a daily basis by leaps and bounds by huge numbers every day? Well, and of course, my passion is oral history. And if you can get them to sit down and just start. It doesn't matter if it's sequential, don't remember facts, because 
generals write uh, battle histories. It's the soldiers that fought, uh, the men that, that worked in the industry, the, the women that stayed home and took care of the families. Everybody's story is unique and precious and it, it needs to be told for the next generation and the next generation. I mean, how many of us wish that we had a Civil War uh, account from a great grandfather or a World War I account or a, an account of the Dust Bowl when our families were struggling on the farms? Every story is precious and has to be told. And when they're gone, it's gone forever and it's a terrible, terrible loss. Sit down and, and just start talking to them. Uh, start with maybe a, a time life book of, of what part of the war they were involved in, whether it was working at Boeing, working on the farm, um, in the Marines at, at Iwo Jima, it just needs to be told everybody's story, not just veterans, but also civilians. You know. With these vets, obviously, too, with Dr. Brenner, he's, you know, th these were uh, memories suppressed, and, and you know, it took a while for him to want to even talk about. So that's probably something that you run into as well, as these uh, vets get older and realize that, the, you know, they're, uh, memories die with them if if they don't express that to somebody. So they're more willing to talk, perhaps. Is that what you find with the World War II vets? Well, absolutely, because Bill Brenner did not talk about this. His family knew very little. Uh, I had his son write the epilogue, and he said his children, they had no idea what had happened. Uh, his daughter went to Consaga University and was surprised to, to meet uh, one of Bill's roommates who was a pilot in his, in his pursuit group. And of course now he's very willing to talk about it and he's very willing to share. So if uh, people want to purchase this book, how much is it and where can they purchase it? Well, it's $22.50 and it will be for sale in the bookstore at the college after uh, December the 5th. And of course that will be our uh, book signing that we're going to have. And then we may find other outlets, but at this point that's uh, either that or, or, or purchase from Bill Brenner in Larned or from myself, Linda McCaffrey at, at Barton College. Okay, with that, Linda, I do appreciate you joining us today. This is Michael Dawes signing off for Cougar Paws.